My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. Parenting is an art that requires understanding, patience, and compassion. Often, we may question appropriate ways to discipline our children in positive and peaceful ways, perhaps in contrast to our own childhood experiences. My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, Sarah R. Moore, says there is a science to peaceful parenting where peace for all begins at home. Sarah R. Moore is the founder of Dandelion Seeds Positive Parenting, a comprehensive, evidence-based parenting community focused on the ripple effect of peaceful parenting. She's also an author, speaker, armchair neuroscientist, and most importantly, a mama. Sarah is a lifelong learner with training in child development, trauma recovery, interpersonal neurobiology, and improv comedy. Her website is dandelion-seeds.com, and she joins me this week to share her experience and new book, Peaceful Discipline, Storytelling, Brain Science, and Better Behavior. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited, Sarah R. Moore. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Victor. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Sarah, your path to peaceful discipline began at a very unpleasant visit with a pediatrician. Please share what happened. (laughs) Yes. Oh, goodness. It's almost a decade ago now, but it still is alive in my heart as if it were yesterday. I had a newborn baby girl. She was only four months old, and I took her in for her standard well check visit to one of the most highly respected doctors in our state where we were living at the time. And early on in that appointment, he looked me in the eye and said, so how's sleep going? And knowing, of course, that she was only four months old, she was sleeping like a four-month-old, which means not a whole lot, right? So I was very honest with him. And I said, she's up every couple of hours, but holistically, she's getting plenty of sleep. And I'm happy to support her whenever she needs me in the meantime. He looked me, looked at me and replied, well, you are ridiculous. Let me know when you're ready to get serious about parenting. She's manipulating you. And the nervous system, as we know, tends to go into fight or flight or freeze or faint. Well, I froze. I absolutely froze and couldn't say a word for the rest of that appointment. However, he lit such a fire in my belly that day that I went home and started researching all of the reasons that, yes, of course, we should be responsible to our children, especially these teeny tiny humans who are developing their attachments style at such an early age. And I started writing about the importance of being responsive to children. And it was the beginning of my peaceful discipline journey in that I knew I wanted to be a peaceful parent anyway. But now I was highly motivated to share the message with others in the world who might be receiving similar questionable, to say it gently, questionable advice, and be empowered to say, no, I am not okay with that. I want something better for my family. Where can I get that? And that was the foundation for Dandelion Seeds Positive Parenting and my peaceful discipline journey. And please tell us about Dandelion Seeds Positive Parenting. Sure. I started it when my daughter was still itty bitty in that I knew I didn't want to just be some random mama on the internet because the world certainly has plenty of those already. I wanted to have enough credentials under my belt that if people started paying attention to my writing, which they were already, and I wasn't even seeking them out, it was happening organically, I wanted to be able to say, here are the things I know because I have studied this in detail. I can point to the resources and references that I've gained over time to know that every recommendation I make is not only based on the heart truth, the intuition we all have, but also 
also based on the science and research of the latest child development, neuroscience, attachment theory, all the things that contribute to raising physically, spiritually, and emotionally healthy human beings. So as far as Dandelion Seeds Positive Parenting specifically goes, um, the name comes from three kind of fun different places. When I was coming up with the name for the business, my daughter was probably about two and a half or three at the time, and dandelions were her favorite quote-unquote flower at the time. So part of it was uh, just a, a gesture to recognize my daughter's role in the business. Secondly, there is a concept of highly sensitive children. Some people call them orchid children. They are the children who need extra nurturing, just like the orchid, the plant needs, because orchids can't survive with just any old conditions, unlike dandelions. Dandelions are, you know, they'll live through anything and come back with a vengeance the following year. But orchids need some special understanding and care to really thrive. So that was number two. And finally, just the uh, the hope that we have for our children. We all know that eventually dandelions turn into what we often call wishes, those cute little fuzzy things that we blow and scatter throughout the fields. And we really want to be able to wish good things for our children in terms of their resiliency and the inner strength that they have to bring out to the world, no matter whether they started as an orchid. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with orchid children. I am raising one, I was one, and I was raised by one as well. So I have a deep appreciation for these sensitive children deep in my soul. But the, the business was really a reflection of all three of those definitions of the dandelion. What a lovely analogy. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. I was brought up in the 1950s and there was an expression back then, spare the rod and spoil the child. Why is punishment not the answer to children's suboptimal behavior? I love this question, and I actually love addressing that specific quote that you just raised. It's still very alive and well today, much to my uh, chagrin, and it's part of the reason I'm doing the work that I'm doing. Some people believe that spare the rod, spoil the child comes from the Bible, when in truth, it actually came from a 17th century poem by a man named Samuel Butler and a poem called Hudibras. And between friends here, it was about a man who wanted a certain type of romantic relationship with his uh, sexual partner. And it certainly has nothing to do with raising children. So so we often have misinterpreted this old advice as the need to be really, really harsh with our children in order to get them to comply. Now, from a parenting perspective, we know that punishments and fear-based methods may quote unquote work in that they do change behavior. And hey, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Parents want quick compliance, right? Quick obedience. However, what we now know from all the research is that punitive parenting, fear-based parenting is linked with all sorts of problematic outcomes. So for example, to use the rod analogy that you raised, people often assume, oh, that means I have to spank my children. Well, we now know that spanking, for example, is linked with increased aggression in our children. It's linked with greater likelihood of substance abuse. It's linked with greater likelihood of suicide attempts, all sorts of horrific things. And I am just the messenger here. We've got all of the research from years and years of data collection now to say that punitive parenting actually does so much more harm than good. And even for the parents who say, well, I was raised in that way and I turned out fine, my question is always a loving and compassionate, could you have turned out more fine if you weren't afraid of your parents? Could you have felt more connected to them? Could you have felt more supported, more empowered, more likely to turn toward your parents during times of struggle in your life rather than running away from them because you were afraid of what they would do? And my goal in Peaceful Discipline is to help bring parents and children closer together so that when children do 
inevitably face struggles in their own lives. And they know that we've got their backs. We are here to help them, not to make them suffer more for the mistakes they have made. So I'm hearing in my head the voice of a father that I know who was a bit of a disciplinarian. And he would say, won't kids learn they can get away with it if they're not punished for their bad behavior? Mm, I love that question. In fact, I expressly answer that question in my book, so I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> well, in, in response to that, I will say that actually the more important lesson that a child can learn from an adult is emotional regulation. We need to raise children who say, when I feel angry, rather than acting out and harming somebody, instead, I can rustle up my inner resources to figure out what it is I am feeling, what it is I am needing, so that I can express my feelings and needs peacefully to others. We also know, based on the research, that children who are punished don't actually learn not to do the behavior. What they actually learn is to keep doing the behavior, but to hide it from the parent. There was a beautiful and fascinating study in Africa a number of years ago where there was a group of children from one school that was treated non-punitively. There was another group from another school that was treated punitively. And they were each subjected to the same experiment where it was essentially to test whether or not children would lie about a certain behavior. Well, the children who went to the non-punitive school were actually much more honest, much more forthcoming, much more likely to confess, yes, you told me not to touch the toy, but I want you to know that I touched the toy. Will you please forgive me? Can we move forward from this? As opposed to the children who were raised in the punitive school, they actually not only had a, a significantly statistically let me rephrase that, statistically significantly, that's hard to say out loud, by the way, um, greater likelihood of lying about what they did, but they were actually really convincing liars as well because they had so much more practice at it. Above and beyond that, the children who were raised in the punitive school were more likely to do the wrong thing in the first place. The moral compass was a little bit more off for them than it was for the children who knew they weren't going to get in trouble because their moral compass was dialed in such a way where they didn't want to do the wrong thing. And if they did, they came clean about it. It's fascinating. So no, we don't have to punish our children and make them think they've gotten away with it if we don't. Instead, connection and compassion and emotional safety are the key to better behavior, not only with us, but also when our children are out and not with us as well. Let's talk a little bit about anger. As adults, many of us have come to learn that if something angers us, rather than respond with anger, we look inside ourselves and see what is there about this situation that angers me that's reflecting or giving me an indication of something that dwells within myself. How can we impress children to respond in the same way? Mm, brilliant question once again. Modeling, modeling, modeling. Many of us were raised to believe that anger is a bad emotion. It's somehow dangerous or scary or something to be avoided or stuffed down. Well, what we know is that the more we do that and the more we model that for children, the more anger finds its way out in unproductive ways. It shows up in our health. It shows up in resentment. It shows up in disconnection in relationships. So instead, if we can model for our children, you know what? Anger is a safe feeling. Everybody gets sometimes. But using nonviolent communication strategies, we can name the feeling. For example, I feel angry right now. We can talk about what we are needing. And by the way, this is not something that we need somebody else to do. It's something that we need for ourselves. For example, I am feeling angry and I need some fresh air so that I can regulate my nervous system for a little while. 
then we need to be able to make clear requests of others, knowing that our anger is ours to manage, even if other people don't accept the requests that we're making of them. But we can view anger as a helper. It's just information. It's here to tell us that we have to create a boundary or perhaps we have a boundary that needs enforcing somehow. But anger is actually our way of telling us that we have an unmet need. And when we can show up for ourselves and model that to our children, our children grow up saying anger is just as safe as happiness, as joy, as elation, anything else. It's all temporary and it's all informational. The key is what do we do with it? How may we parent in a way that makes our children actually want discipline, peaceful discipline? One of my favorite questions, well, certainly non-punitive discipline is my specialty. And one of the things I've written about extensively in the book is how to create emotional safety between parent and child. And quoting a couple of other authors who I deeply respect, Drs. Tina Payne Bryson and Daniel J. Siegel, they talk about the four S's of secure attachment, safe, seen, soothed, and secure. When we are able to provide those four S's to our children, they will actually seek us out for teaching for helping them understand how to get along well in the world. So one of the ways that we can do that is through storytelling. And some people might be saying, well, how on earth am I supposed to sit down and tell a story? Number one, I'm not creative. Number two, when I'm frustrated, I don't want to tell a story. I just want my kid to do the darn thing, whatever it may be. That's actually not at all what I'm talking about. I'm talking about things we can do in three different ways. One is proactively. How can we tell stories either based on fact or based on fiction? They might be things we make up. They might be things we pull out of a book from our bookshelf. It does not require intense creativity. But how can we help prepare our children through stories for experiences that they are about to encounter so that when they do encounter them, they encounter them peacefully and we don't need to have conflict at all. Secondly, we can do in the moment stories. Many people call this playful parenting, where we simply get lighthearted, we get curious about our children's behavior, and we find ways to teach in the moment in emotionally safe ways. And then finally, we can do retroactive storytelling. Perhaps something has happened that wasn't optimal. We don't like the way something happened, and we want to teach our child about how to behave better next time. We can use stories as a wonderful and benevolent teacher to help redirect our child's behavior and, by the way, heal emotionally from stressful events by talking through stories about things that have already happened. And I've got a very, very detailed outline of how to do this in the book so that it's emotionally and logistically accessible for all of us. And the good news is, when we teach through stories, we directly access the part of our child's brain that can remember our lessons the most easily. The scientific uh, details don't matter a whole lot, but it's called the hippocampus, and every single one of us has this hippocampus. It is the brain storyteller, so that for somebody who's listening to this, you might not remember that you listened to this story, this conversation on December, whatever it was of this year, But instead, you'll remember, I heard this conversation about peaceful discipline while I was in my kitchen doing dishes. And this is how my body felt. This is what the smell was that that was in the room. Our bodies are constantly telling stories. And when we can directly access that emotional memory generator for our children, it makes the memories of what we're teaching so much more accessible for our kids down the road. So we don't have to keep repeating ourselves. And that, of course, makes parenting so much easier. You offer several examples of storytelling in Peaceful Discipline. Would you share one or two with us, please? Yes, I'd be happy to. So I'll talk about an in-the-moment one that I've got in the book. Let's pretend, for example, that 
I'm tired. I'm a parent who's working and parenting and all of the other things that I do that fill my days from the moment I wake up until the moment I go to sleep. And I don't like redoing things I've already done. Let's pretend I have just put away all of the laundry. The house is finally a little bit cleaner and I'm feeling like I can relax for two seconds before the next thing while I walk into my child's bedroom. And what are they doing? They are haphazardly pulling all of the freshly folded clothes right out of their drawers and making a colossal mess out of the bedroom. Well, number one, I want to show up for this parent and say, I get it. Nobody wants to have to clean up twice. And yes, your anger reaction, your frustration reaction is normal. But a typical reaction to that might be, what on earth is wrong with you? What are you doing? I just cleaned that up. Why are you doing this to me? And to get upset with the child and to drive an emotional wedge between you and the child that not only makes the child feel crummy, but makes you later feel like a jerk as a parent. And nobody wants to live that way. So instead, what we can do, let's take the same scenario, parent walks into the child's bedroom and sees them flipping all the clothes out of the drawer. Instead, the parent can first of all take a couple of seconds to self-regulate. One more shirt out of the drawer isn't going to make or break the whole bedroom. But if I can take a breath and say, okay, something is going on here. I don't know what it is, but I know I want to respond peacefully here. What happens if I choose a playful approach and I go in and let's say I catch a pair of pants midair and say, all right, number 38 runs these in for the touchdown and deposits the pants back in the drawer, well, guess what? I now have my child's attention. My child is probably going to stop throwing the clothes and I can look at my child and say, hey, I'm curious what's going on here. The child can explain why they were doing what they were doing. So we as the parent get more information. Perhaps they actually had a really good reason for doing that. We don't know yet. And then we can take a lighthearted, playful approach, perhaps even still in character, where, whether it's football or whether we come up with something else in the moment, to start throwing the clothes back in the drawer. Maybe at this point, I don't care that they're not perfectly folded anymore. I just want them out of my sight. But I can live with this. The child is going to remember the clothes need to stay in the drawer. I can communicate that peacefully, but I can do it in a way where the child has this lighthearted emotional anchor of, oh, right, I wasn't supposed to be doing that. But my parent taught me in a way that was fun. It was engaging. It was collaborative. And best of all, it's memorable so that next time, you know, I'm eight years old and I'm throwing the clothes out of my drawer. I can say, hold on. I remember something from last time. I better stop this. And maybe there's another way to handle the situation. So same scenario, two very different responses from the parent. But one is going to keep the peace and get the job done. And the other one is only going to cause emotional harm even if the stuff does technically get picked up. How do you want to learn? I prefer the latter way. I agree 100%. My guest is Sarah R. Moore. Her book, Peaceful Discipline, Story Teaching, Brain Science, and Better Behavior. Sarah, please tell our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about you and this wonderful work. Thank you so much. The book is available worldwide on Amazon. It is available for pre-order at Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, all of the big stores you can possibly imagine. And I am thrilled to say it is also available either for order or pre-order, depending on the bookstore, at all sorts of wonderful independent booksellers nationwide and globally as well. And they can learn more about me at dandelionseeds.com. There is a hyphen in there. It's dandelion-seeds.com and Dandelion Seeds Positive Parenting on all of the social media except for Instagram, where I'm Dandelion Seeds Positive Living because parenting wouldn't fit. <laughs> and we'll be back with more of Sarah after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. The best of the holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization 
Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Sarah R. Moore. Her book, Peaceful Disciplines, Story Teaching, Brain Science, and Better Behavior. Sarah, I was a very precocious kid. Uh, I was also a sensitive child growing up in the 50s. And I had this fascination and interest in everything electronic and mechanical and so on. And I would occasionally take apart an appliance and successfully take it apart, but not successfully put it back together, (laughs) which resulted in the ire of my father. And as we shared before, he would apply a little bit of corporal punishment when this would happen. Now, is there a way to discipline a child's behavior without making them feel ashamed? Because I felt a tremendous sense of shame when this would happen. Yes, yes. Well, first of all, or all sorts of love and compassion to your inner child, because we carry these stories with us emotionally, and that shame is really hard to shake. So I just want to take a moment and acknowledge that that must have been really, really hard for you. And, you know, your your inner child was always worthy of love and compassion. I share that with, with you, for you, but also for anybody else who might be listening who has a story like that of their own. It's, it's, it's hard to carry around this feeling of not having been enough, even when it was something like genuine curiosity that was your motivator for taking these things apart. Of course, you wanted to know how they worked, and there's nothing wrong with that. So as for teaching our children, when they have done something, quote unquote, wrong. One of my favorite quotes actually comes from a woman by the name of Kelly Matthews. She learned it from her predecessor in her early childhood work. I believe that woman's name was Deb Matthews. Um, But that notwithstanding, the quote is, don't get mad, get curious. And that has always been such a great starting point for me as a parent, because of course, there are going to be things that our children do that make us think they've lost their marbles. Why on earth would my child take apart this electronic thing? They could have been hurt. Now the thing is broken. All sorts of problems here. But if I as a parent can say, using a little you, if I may, as our um, as our muse here, Victor, I see how much you wanted to take apart this thing. Can you tell me what was going on for you? What was happening when you took this apart? My guess is that little you would have said, I wanted to see how it worked. Well, that's very different information for me as a parent than, I don't know, I just felt like breaking it, you know? So if I can, as a parent, say, all right, so you want to know how things work. Tell you what, this thing cost a lot of money, so it's important that we keep it all in one piece. Same with all the other electronics in our house, by the way. However, I can tell that you are an engineer at heart. How about, or at least part of you is, how about if we enroll you in an engineering class where you have an opportunity, maybe even robotics, an opportunity to build and take apart all sorts of things. That way we have a positive outlet for this desire that you have to learn how things work. In doing this, I get to state the boundary, the things at home need to stay together, but let's find a way to still meet the legitimate need that you have to learn. Now, just for a second, bear with me. Let's pretend that little Victor's response to me was, I just wanted to break it. Well, here as a parent, I also want to lead with curiosity and say every behavior is an expression of a need. So even if you told me that you had quote unquote malicious intent, my cue as the parent is to say, I wonder if you're angry about something. I'm wondering if you're sad about something. You know what? I can get introspective and say, 
oh, sweetheart, I know I just had a two hour meeting and you had to wait watching TV all by yourself all that time. I bet you were really lonely and you were looking for a way to get my attention. Is that what was going on for you? Odds are pretty good that this little child is going to say, yeah, it was really hard. You're always in meetings. And all of a sudden, I have a much different scene to analyze, figure out what's happening for the child. Are they feeling disconnected? Did I somehow cause the rupture or at least contribute to the rupture in our relationship so that my child felt that they had no other option but to break something to get my attention. For me, that is an act of desperation from the child rather than an act of malicious behavior. And in either one of these scenarios, you know what comes up for me? It's compassion. I might also be frustrated because the thing is expensive and hard to replace. But if compassion is in there even a little bit, I can lead with that in my parenting and figure out how can we get to the root cause of the problem, be it curiosity, loneliness, whatever it may be, so that we can solve that instead of simply punishing our child on the surface. And I'm curious, Victor, how does that land with your inner child who just wanted to know how the stuff worked? My inner child loves it. And my inner child would say, at seven years old in 1960, I would have loved to have gone to engineering school. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. But but 100%, 100%, absolutely. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, devil's advocate time again. So I hear that voice saying, why can't we just tell our kids what we expect of their behavior and have them learn it? Why don't they seem to be improving or not behaving consistently? Mm, Great question. So we know that once again, let's go back to brain science. Brains are really busy organs, especially for children. Let's let's take off our adult hats here for a second, put on our child hats. If I am a child under the age of 10, heck, under the age of 25, number one, my brain hasn't fully developed yet. The prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that thinks about things like consequences of our actions and effects on others and other people's perspectives and all those things, that part of the brain literally has not fully formed until between ages 25 and 30. What is Is our brain busy doing though when we're younger, particularly when we are younger children? We are learning how to walk. We're learning how to talk. We're learning how to express our feelings and needs. We're learning how to perhaps go to school or get along well on the playground. Our brains are learning so many things every single moment of every day that frankly, to be, you know, really informal about it, some of the things are just going to fall off the shelf. If you tell a child, hey, that, you know, that thing needs to stay over there. Okay, that's nice. But I'm still trying to figure out how to get from point A to point B without falling down on my face, right? There's so much happening in the evolving childhood brain that if we simply tell them, hey, I want you to do this thing, it is legitimately hard to remember, largely because there is no emotional anchor that makes it memorable and desirable. We also know from brain science that, not to mention common sense, we want more of the things that feel good and less of the things that feel bad. So if I do something right, by the adult standards. And the the adult says, you know what, I love the way you did that. That means so much to me. Gosh, you're getting so strong. What a great helper you are. In fact, let's go out and celebrate this thing that worked well for us. That's going to create positive messages in the child's brain to say, I want more of this. This feels good. This is a repeatable process that I want to be able to keep doing because this works. Now, interestingly, let's say for the devil's advocate, so to speak, who says, all right, well, if you need an emotional anchor, how about that spanking? That'll teach him not to do it. Actually, no. What happens here is that The limbic system, which is one of the earliest parts of the brain to form, the limbic system takes over with fight or flight. When the limbic system is in charge, the learning brain is essentially off. 
the brain literally cannot learn new things when it is trying to figure out, am I even safe here? So although over time, the child might, quote unquote, learn from punishment, they actually, as we discussed earlier, learn more of what to avoid instead of learning what behavior they should be doing. So when we can approach our children with positive discipline, with positive reinforcement, and I'm not talking about rewards and stickers and that kind of thing, but I'm talking about feel-good moments of emotional safety together, particularly through things like stories and play and connection, that creates a deep emotional anchor for the child where they want to keep doing things that feel good because that is actually their very best teacher. And then we don't have to keep repeating ourselves because they will have that anchor of what to do and why, because it feels good, already solidified in the neural connections that their brain has made about the experience. Most of us don't like to hear the N word, that is no. But you offer ways to make no a positive experience. What are a few of these? Yes, I learned many of these back in my days in corporate America during my executive negotiation classes. And guess what? Executive negotiation applies to parenting too. Number one is we can look for win-win scenarios. Because you're right, nobody likes to be told no. If my child looks at me and says, hey, you know what? It's five minutes till bedtime. Can we go out for ice cream? That's going to be a no. It's five minutes till bedtime. But if I tell her no, just a flat out no, well, guess what? Now we're probably extending bedtime by an hour because she's going to have an ice cream meltdown. Notice the intentional pun there. And it's going to be emotionally problematic. We're not going to get anywhere with it. We're going to have disconnection between us. However, if I can validate the feeling and say, oh, my goodness, ice cream is so delicious, isn't it? You know what? Right now it's bedtime. That's the win for me as the parent. I'm enforcing bedtime. However, you know what? Tomorrow, we don't have anything going on. How about if we do a special ice cream date tomorrow afternoon? The child is then going to feel like it's also a win for them. And it works for both of us. It is what I call a positive no. Another alternative might be, let me think of one quickly. Let's talk about another executive negotiation term. It's called the banta or best alternative to the negotiated agreement. You know what? Let's say a oh, child wants ice cream, but we're not going to be going out for ice cream anytime soon. This is just not something that is feasible right now or in the near future for whatever reason. All right. So I get to still say to my child, number one, validation. Oh, ice cream is so good good. I really, really wish we could have it too. That sounds amazing. It's delicious. And you know what? We're not having any ice cream coming up anytime soon. However, what is something else that's really special that we could do together that would be a lot of fun? Oh, you want to go to the playground next week? Yeah, we can do that one day next week. That's something that is completely different from the request at hand, but it's something that is still an acceptable alternative to both of us that still feels like a yes in our nervous system. And speaking of no, for many grown-ups, healthy boundary setting is a challenge. How may we teach children to set boundaries? So important. Yes. Most important thing we can do once again is model healthy boundaries. A lot of us, let's face it, even as adults, struggle with either way too much rigidity when it comes to our boundaries or way too much chaos. Essentially, we don't have any boundaries. What we can model for our children is figuring out which boundaries are worth creating and which are worth enforcing along with which are worth letting go. And the way we model this for our children is by talking about them. So it might be, for example, I say out loud to my child, you know, my friend Jennifer called and asked if I could meet her for lunch today. But the thing is, I'm really busy. I already have so much going on. So I need to say no to her. I'm going to create that boundary. And I'm going to say, let's make a plan for next week instead. You know what? That way I get to value my own, my own time while still 
respecting the relationship. If I can say simple things like this to my child, my child learns from me, oh, you get to say no to people sometimes, but there are still other parts of the situation that might be a yes. Children get to practice this with us then. Our children actually should say no to us because if we have effectively modeled healthy boundary setting, they're going to try it out on us. And if we as a disciplinarian parent come back and say, you don't get to say no to me, I'm the parent here. We actually don't give our children the opportunity to practice having boundaries and setting them in the healthy ways that they're going to need in every other relationship of their lives. So number one, model it. Number two, be the recipient, the willing and active recipient of the child's boundaries when they try to express them with us. As humans, most of us experience an occasional bad day, and some of us more than occasional. Do we have to be peaceful and positive to use these tools 100% of the time? You know, if we had to do it 100% of the time, I would have called the book Perfect Parenting, but I didn't. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. In fact, when I told my daughter that I was writing a parenting book, she ever so innocently looked up at me and said, oh, is it about how to make mistakes? You're really good at that. And it caught me off guard and I laughed, but she was absolutely right. I am an expert mistake maker. We all get to be human. We all get to mess up. In fact, in the book, I probably have more examples of things I've done wrong than things I've done right. And I want to normalize. This is called being human and that's okay. What we do with this though, to help raise emotionally healthy children is we repair with our children when we make a mistake. We own up to the mistake we've made. We apologize. We talk about the things that we are doing to help avoid making the same mistakes in the future. When we do this, when we model accountability, we raise children who own up to their own mistakes as well. Because guess what? We're humans raising humans. They're going to mess up too. And my goal as a parent, one of my primary goals is to raise a child who knows how to make really good mistakes and how to make up for them when she does. That's a life skill. Absolutely. Her book is called Peaceful Discipline, Story Teaching, Brain Science, and Better Behavior. We'll be back with more of Sarah Moore after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Hey, Dad, your prescription will be ready in just a minute. Hey, Dad, your laundry will be ready in just a minute. Dad, your lunch will be ready in just a minute. Hey, honey, why don't you take a minute? When you help care for a loved one, you give them as much time as you can. But it's just as important to take time for yourself. AARP can help. Find free care guides to support you and your loved one at aarp.org slash caregiving. That's aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Look out, world, we're getting strong. The future's here and we belong. She can step, she can do more. Like build a rocket and watch it soar. Clean the oceans and make the world a better place. Learn more at She Can STEM, a message brought to you by the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week, Sarah R. Moore, her book, Peaceful Discipline, Story Teaching, Brain Science, and Better Behavior. Earlier on, Sarah, you mentioned highly sensitive children. What would you offer to parents of these children? Mm, I would offer them so much 
compassion because I understand that it is not like raising any other child who's out there who is less sensitive. And by less sensitive, I don't mean insensitive. I just mean that for highly sensitive children, they're physically feeling and experiencing life differently than everybody else around them. We know that their highs are higher. They aren't just happy, they're elated. We also know that their lows can be lower. They're not just sad, they can be devastated. And as the parent who is trying to navigate these emotional expressions from our children, it can be really tiring. And even as a sensitive person raising a sensitive child, I know firsthand that it can be tiring, so I get it. But I want you to know that you are not alone. And the more we learn about how to support these sensitive children and show up for them in the unique ways that they truly need and that are different from the needs of other children, the more we will see them thrive and we will see their gift of sensitivity become such an incredible blessing to the world. If only we don't squash them, they will become the change makers. They will become the ones who don't stand for injustice. They will become the ones who love so deeply that they become part of the healing that the world so desperately needs. So by all means, embrace these children, seek support if you need it, and know that you are not alone. You share that there are 10 scientifically proven ways to raise happy kids. What are a couple of those? Yeah, a couple of those. Number one, quality time. We know that we have really busy schedules in this day and age. And sometimes it seems like the child has so much energy that we just need to keep scheduling them for all the things. And the truth is, if we want a child to be deeply happy at their core, we need to give them the space to feel that joy. And they can't feel it if we are constantly rushing them off to the next big thing. So allowing them downtime with you, where you are connected and engaged and present together, is perhaps the number one thing you can do. Another really big one is spend time in nature. Spend time looking up from the screens as hard as it may be and just get outside with your child. Children who spend time in nature have a deeper appreciation for the world around them And not only their teeny, teeny, tiny part in it, they start to realize that they are not everything. They are just part of something greater. It's beautiful perspective for them while also helping them see the change that they can make in the world for the better. So those are two of my top tips. Just be with the child, give them downtime, and get outside. Who doesn't love that as a recipe for a happier life? Absolutely. And you touched upon a very important subject. One of the challenges in raising children today, as opposed to the 1950s and 60s when I grew up, is digital technology. How may parents guide their children to healthy screen time? Number one, again, modeling it. And I confess, I struggle with this. Much of my own business is online. So when we take the time to model the kinds of behaviors that we want our children to learn, we give them a wonderful service because they know that they are not going to be at the whim of every ding and notification that comes up as well. Number two, schedule screen-free time. I can't stress enough how much happier my weeks are when I have, for example, a screen-free Sunday that, you know what, it looks a whole lot like 1950 or 1960 because the phone is just off. It is physically turned all the way off. It's in a drawer. And I figure if there's some sort of emergency, somebody will find a way to get a hold of me. But knock on wood, there hasn't been a single emergency on a screen-free Sunday yet. And it is such a beautiful reset, not only for my nervous system, but also for the collective nervous system of the whole family, where we can really reconnect again and live a more wholesome life, even if it's just for a single day a week. And screen time includes cable news and the almost nonstop negative news cycle. How may we support our children who are overwhelmed and perhaps frightened by this? 
Yes, limit access. Oftentimes, parents will give their children these devices, and it's a free-for-all. Parental controls are there for a reason. Talk ahead of time with your children about, let's choose the apps that are appropriate for you together. Let's install only those apps on your phone. Let's talk about what to do if you see something that concerns you on any level. And you have this ongoing dialogue with your children about what's helpful healthy and what's not. But you have to be proactive about it. You can't just assume, well, it's out there, they're going to find it. No, they don't have to, because we are still the parent. This is not disciplinarian parenting. This is respectful and responsible parenting in that we have an obligation to protect young eyes from things that they are truly not ready to see yet. The onus is on us to make sure that they don't have access to things that could be damaging to them in any way. Probably one of the most difficult things for a parent to do, especially for younger children, is share the news of the passing of a family member or a beloved friend. How should we do this? Oh, that is such a tough one. And my heart goes out to people in that situation who might be listening to this right now. First of all, know that the child's experience is going to be separate from your experience. So for example, and I'll be brief here, but I remember when my own grandfather passed away a number of years ago, he was in his upper 90s, and he was so ready. But still, I was, you know, in my gosh, I think I was probably in my early 40s when he passed. So I had 40 years of loving this man. And when he died, my daughter had actually never even met him. I was very sad. She wasn't. And I had to accept that her grief was conceptual as opposed to the reality that I was feeling. Now, I didn't want to impose my feelings upon her, so I had to respect that she wasn't going to react as I thought she might if I were to assume she would feel the same way I did. Now, let's talk briefly about a child who is deeply emotionally affected by the loss of a loved one. Best thing we can do is allow them the space to feel it. The same doctors I mentioned earlier today, Tina Payne Bryson and Dan Siegel, talk about feeling it to heal it. If we try to distract our child from the pain, you know what, let's just think of the good memories and that's it. And let's go have a celebration. And, you know, grandpa or grandma or whoever would love it if we would go out for ice cream because it was their favorite thing. By the way, second ice cream reference of today, I think I might be craving ice cream. I digress. Anyway, you know, if we try to simply cheer up our child, what they learn in that moment is emotional suppression. Instead, if we as the adult can say, what do I need to be able to create emotional safety around whatever big feelings my child might have, as long as they need to have them, as often as they need to have them, however their grieving process feels to them, it's their reality. My job isn't to fix it by putting a Band-Aid on it. My job is to say, let's feel this Because the more you feel it authentically, the more your body will naturally come to a place of acceptance and peace with the loss. You offer seven ways to earn and keep our children's hearts. Please share one or two. Yeah, one is understanding that they are really different people from us. And although that sounds so simple, it can really be hard. I'll share very personally, you know, my daughter and I are big readers and always have been. My daughter is very much like me and her wiring in that way. My husband, however, is a really active, rough and tumble, you know, let's go outside and kick the ball around kind of guy. And he had to acknowledge that if he really wanted to earn and keep my daughter's heart, he was going to have to invest some time sitting on the couch with a book open on his lap with her sitting right next to him. That was going to be part of her feeling emotionally seen because that's something that's really special to her. So simply knowing what matters to our children and doing that thing with them even if it's not our thing. Does it mean we have to do Legos 12 hours a day? Heck no. I would keel over if that were my, you know, fate in life. But if we can sometimes show up for them authentically doing the things that they want to do, that is a great way to help them feel seen. And another way, I've touched on this before, but we as parents really need 
to just slow down and be with our children, however that looks. We are in such a chronic and really problematic state in our society where we are overachieving almost all the time. Those simple days, be it a screen-free Sunday, be it taking a walk together in nature, I'm kind of highlighting some of the things we've talked about, finding time to actually invest in one another and get to know what is on our child's heart without being quick to solve, quick to fix, quick to suggest solutions, whatever it might be. Just listen to our children within whatever peaceful space we are creating together. Helps our children feel seen and valued in such beautiful ways that they will actually crave more time with us rather than seeking validation elsewhere. It's a beautiful way to nurture the relationship. The L word, listen and love. Yes, exactly. The Wisdom of Sarah R. Moore, her book, Peaceful Discipline, Story Teaching, Brain Science, and Better Behavior. Sarah, one more time, please tell our listeners where they can get your books and find out more about you and your work. Thanks so much. The book is available worldwide, either for order or pre-order, depending where you are in the world, but it's available for order almost everywhere globally on Amazon, uh, also available at all of the major stores, Target, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, you name it. Additionally, many independent bookstores globally are now carrying the book, so I'm very excited about that. As for where to learn about me, I am at dandelionseeds.com. There is a hyphen there, dandelion-seeds.com. Dot com, Dandelion Seeds Positive Parenting on all of the social media except for Instagram where I'm Dandelion Seeds Positive Living because parenting wouldn't fit. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your wisdom and experience. Victor, you are a gift. Thank you so much for this conversation. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week.